it's time to do a review on the new Tundra. It's been a little over a year since I bought it, and in that time I've put over 40,000 miles on it, had lots of questions, and loads of dumb comments about it. The most common being real men drive V8s. I feel sorry for the men whose masculinity relies on the number of cylinders their truck has. We all know that it's really tied to the size of your tires, and I have 37s. Other people have called it the worst truck ever because it has a quarter of an inch less leg room or because the screen is too large or even because you lose too much visibility because of the grab handle. One comment I see again and again is, should have bought American. And this one is particularly special because the Tundra is actually known for being one of the most American trucks you can buy. It's designed here, built here, and according to the latest data from 2022, uses more American-made components than almost every other car on the market. And I know it's a Japanese company, but almost three quarters of the cost of your average vehicle goes towards the production, components and materials, research and development, and the facilities. That leaves about a quarter of it that's split between marketing, the dealers, and the manufacturer profit. That sounds fake. If buying American is important to you, the Tundra and the Ford F-150 are the only two full-size trucks you should consider. If you really want to have a truck that helps the American economy, then you need to trade in your Mexican-made Sierras and Silverados for a Honda Ridgeline. The Honda Ridgeline keeps more money in the US than any other truck, if you can call it that. Finally, there's the comments saying, What's ugly? Okay, you've got me there. It takes some modifications to get this truck looking good, but most of the comments from the haters make less sense than what my baby says. <laughs> Seriously though, there are legitimate problems with the 22 and above Tundra. It's not perfect. But let's start talking about something that I do like, and that's the drivetrain. The twin turbo V6 is an incredible engine and it produces more power and torque than the outgoing 5.7 liter V8. Of course, one of the concerns with a turbocharged engine is the turbo lag. My daily driver has a 1.8 liter engine with a single turbo and you can feel when it starts working. The Tundra, on the other hand, is not like that at all. The two turbos produce almost constant power with minimal lag. The introduction of the turbos wasn't without issues. Early on in the production, a bad batch of wastegate actuators caused a number of trucks to go into limp mode, much to the delight of the V8 purists who made sure to play it up as much as possible. Toyota never officially told us how many were affected, but Tundras.com tracked and documented every Facebook post and article that they could find and came up with 26 failures. The two biggest polls on the Tundra owners group with 76,000 members both came up with 14 failures. Now I'm certain that that's just a small fraction, a small representation of the true number of issues, but I guess that we're probably looking at a few hundred in total. If you're thinking about getting a Tundra now, that is no longer an issue. What makes the powertrain setup even better is the fantastic 10-speed transmission. It is the smoothest transmission that I have ever driven. I'm not sure how they did it, but you often can't even tell that it's changed gears. Together, they produce something that's decent on gas in its stock setup. When I first bought the truck, I was averaging the high teens and even getting slightly over 22 miles per gallon on the long highway trips without actually trying particularly hard. As soon as I modified it for overlanding, I ruined it. Adding a lift and 35 inch tires brought me down to around 14 miles per gallon. And now that I'm on 37s, it's dropped to around 13.5 miles per gallon on average. Towing also increases the fuel consumption a lot, but it seems to be mostly affected by the drag of what you're towing rather than the weight. I towed a 9,000 pound low profile, low drag trailer from Kentucky to Kansas at 65 miles per hour and got 12 and a half miles per gallon. Then I towed a 7,000 pound travel trailer from Kentucky to Utah at 65 miles per hour and got seven and a half miles per gallon. That was with a pretty strong headwind, so on the way home, I had a tailwind and I actually went faster at 70 miles per hour and got 
10 and a half miles per gallon. While the fuel economy wasn't great, I was never lacking power. Obviously I knew the trailer was there, I'm not gonna pretend that I didn't, but the acceleration was great and I was able to set the cruise control and relax. Even going through Colorado with the 30 foot travel trailer on I-70, I had no problems sticking to the speed limit, never going above 3,500 RPM right up until a car decided they wanted to pull out in front of me at 35 miles an hour on the steepest climb out of Denver and I had to hit the brakes. I was able to accelerate back up to speed and pass them, but that did take a little more effort. The hybrid is supposed to be even better for acceleration and towing. A lot of people have been disappointed with the gas mileage of the hybrid, but that's not what it's for in the Tundra. It'll give you more power for pulling away and adds to the torque for pulling heavy loads. I don't regret not getting the hybrid since the hybrid loses that under seat storage that I filled up, but I think if I towed more often then I probably would have picked it up over the regular setup. If I towed heavy loads a lot then I'd probably just get a heavy duty diesel which rules out the Tundra because they don't make them in diesel or heavy duty. On the road, the truck handles really well. The ride is smooth, the steering is suitably weighted, and the stock suspension handles bumps and potholes really well. You get minimal shimmy uh, that you seem to get with unloaded trucks and unloaded beds. Unfortunately, the brakes seem to be a little lackluster. They stop the truck just fine, don't get me wrong, but with all of the weight that I've added to my truck, I'd like them to be a little bit better. I actually warped mine within about 10,000 miles, and that's with 35s, but long before I added all of the weight that you see now. And I've heard stories of several other people having warping issues. I'd love to upgrade to a power brake setup, but that's a lot of money. Despite my complaints with the brakes warping, the Tundra is actually the safest full-size truck you can buy, far outscoring all of the others in crash tests. In the small overlap, the moderate overlap, the roof strength and the side crash, it all got the highest possible score. And it's actually the only full-size truck to get the top safety pick award. And the only other truck that got the award was a mid-size Rivian R1T. Inside, I've noticed that the Tundra tends to drive a lot like a car, even down to the seating position. I ended up adding seat jackers to mine, which lifted the seat to a more truck-like driving position. It helps with seeing over the hood when taking off-road and makes it comfortable for all six foot one of me on long days of driving. There's also plenty of headroom and shoulder room. On paper, the shoulder room is slightly less than the previous generation, but sitting in both, it's definitely not cramped. And in fact, the only really noticeable difference is that the new one has a larger center console and the seats are slightly further apart, so you're just slightly closer to the window. And I think that's where you lose that elbow room. All of the extra space in the center leaves room for approximately 38 cup holders throughout the entire truck. Unfortunately, the main two are as useless as you'd expect from Toyota. They might be marginally better than the previous generations, but I've still lost an entire fountain drink while cornering. Rear legroom is also great in the Crew Max, although the double cab is only for people with no legs. The rear seat headroom is acceptable in the regular models, but if you have the panoramic sunroof, it cuts into the headroom so much that anyone over about six foot three is gonna be uncomfortably close to the roof. The only time I don't enjoy driving the Tundra is when I'm going through a drive-through. A legitimate complaint that I've seen about this is that the turning circle is pretty dire. It's about 10% worse than the previous generation Tundra, which might not sound like a lot, but you'll be taking out the cones in the Chick-fil-A drive through One of my first impressions when I got the truck was the 14-inch screen looked ridiculous. It's the same size as my laptop screen. Now that I've used it for a year, there's no way I would ever go back to the 8-inch screen. The display is fantastic for navigation, whether it's Google Maps or more detailed apps like Onyx Off-Road, who are actually the sponsor of this video. Onyx is an app for finding off-road trails, navigating, and tracking your trails. There are more than half a million miles of off-road trails marked on Onyx that tell you the distance, the difficulty, and the time that you can expect to take on it. You can also combine all these trails into a route of your own using the route builder on the web browser and then both those curated trails and the ones that you create show up on the app which you can pull up on CarPlay or Android Auto on the huge screen to use to navigate while you're driving your Tundra. 
I'll put a link in the description so you can learn more and get 20% off the Elite subscription. While the large screen is fantastic for CarPlay and the camera system, which I'll talk about later, it is let down by the awkward radio interface. Switching radio stations is clunky, so I ended up just adding a bunch of favorites that I just cycle through using the steering wheel controls. My truck came with the JBL sound system, which was incredibly bassy. I actually ended up removing the sub to make room for the back storage panel of my seat delete, and I actually think it sounds better now because I can hear the music over the bass. The quality is better than most of the cars that I've owned and driven, but uh, I'm sure that an audiophile could find something to complain about. Some of the technology I complained about in an earlier video actually helps on the long road trips. I thought that the active lane centering was the biggest gimmick of them all, but when you're driving 30 plus hours, it's actually pretty nice to have. Don't get me wrong, it's not great. Uh, it tends to wander a little bit within the lane and it doesn't work at all if the lines are faded, but it helps on the long stretches of straight road. It just kind of gives your arms and your hands a little bit of a break. The automatic start-stop is triggered by pushing firmly on the brake pedal while you're stationary. Once you get used to that triggering point, it's actually easy to stop the truck without triggering it if you want to keep the engine running. Unfortunately, some of the tech is still completely useless. The automatic headlights just aren't worth using at all. They often miss people coming the other way, and then if you manually turn the high beams off, they flip back on again a few seconds later. I just leave those automatic headlights off completely and do the full manual control. The worst thing is the automatic climate control, though. It either wants to blow hot or cold. That's not a problem in the middle of winter or in the height of summer, but let's say it's 60 degrees outside and the truck is sitting in the sun, you have your climate control set to 65, you'll get in and you'll get blasted with hot air and it's just unpleasant. It's almost like it goes off the outside temperature rather than the inside temperature. As a result, I pretty much always leave the temperature set to 60 degrees and then just manually adjust the fan speed. The limited trim and above come with heated and cooled seats as standard, where only heated seats are an option on the SR5. Obviously, heated seats are great, but the cooled seats are well worth spending a little bit extra for. In the summer, they're fantastic for cooling you down quickly, even while the truck itself is still cooling with the air conditioning. It's also nice if you're traveling with someone who's not exactly the same temperature as you, because you can turn on your cooled seat while they leave theirs off. Let's talk now about off-road use, since that's what I got mine for. First off, it's not a Jeep and it never will be, no matter how many modifications you do to it. If your priority is wheeling and obstacles, then you want a Gladiator, not the Tundra. The Tundra is big and it's unwieldy and the size and the poor turning circle make tight trails and technical trails difficult. Uh, definitely not impossible, but it requires more planning and more spotting and you're not gonna take it as many places as you would a Gladiator. Where the truck really shines is on the long distance overland trips and on rough but fast paced roads. It just eats up the small bumps and dips and it handles washboard roads beautifully. Probably better than any other vehicle that I've ever been in, including things like the Lexus LX470, the LX570. For trips like the Idaho backcountry discovery route and the Pacific Crest Overland route that I did, I would take the Tundra over my wife's Jeep or my old 4Runner any day. The extra payload, the space, the storage, especially with the drawer system that I have in the back, make it perfect for taking out on trips where you'll be out for weeks at a time and covering a lot of ground. The engine power also helps a lot. When my 4Runner was swamped with the weight of the gear and adding the 33 inch tires, the Tundra still has tons of power and acceleration, even with the topper on the back and the 37 inch tires with stock gearing. The features of the TRD off-road trim that's available on the SR5, the Limited, the 1794, and the TRD Pro do help somewhat for off-road use. I have never used the crawl control, I rarely use the rear locker, and I occasionally use the multi-terrain select, but I almost always use the camera system that comes standard on the Limited and above TRD off-road models. 
They even use it in parking lots. The main view from the camera system defaults to either a front or a rear view, as well as a top down 360 degree view. When you go into four low or you select the off-road option, you get a front view and then views down the entire length of the sides of the vehicle. And the front view can either show you where your wheels are going to go using little lines, or you can switch it to a view where it takes little pictures that shows you what is underneath the tires at any time. My favorite and most used view is from the wing mirrors showing the front tires. It's super useful for seeing tire placement as you go over obstacles or to see if you can fit through a gap like the ones through downed trees. As you pass through that gap, you can also switch that view so it starts looking back down the side of the vehicle and just make sure that you're going to clear it. The mirrors also have a button that you can push to fold them in and it helps you squeeze through those tight spots while retaining the camera views to help you see. This is a feature that I've used a lot, again going through downed trees or other narrow gaps. While the camera system was obviously designed for off-road use, there are a lot of things on the truck that weren't, and it takes a lot of modifications to get it suitable. First of all, there are no recovery points, none at all. If you want them on the front, you'll need an aftermarket bumper or aftermarket recovery points, like the ones you get on the CBI Covert or Full Bumper, which are both available on revereoverland.com. I personally like the full bumper since the front end of the truck doesn't have great ground clearance and that low plastic bumper is particularly vulnerable. I actually tore mine up before switching to the CBI bumper. Uh, I'd also recommend getting rock sliders and a rear bumper if you're planning on taking any obstacles because the rear and the breakover clearance are also pretty bad. Underneath, according to the build sheet, you get a skid plate, if you can call it that. It's like a postage stamp sized piece of plastic. And yeah, I know it's ballistic grade nylon, but nylon is plastic. The good news is that steel skid plates are on revereoverland.com too. Now let's talk about the reliability and the build quality. Reliability is obviously a tough one. The truck hasn't been out for very long. A lot of second gen Tundra owners like to point out that's had four recalls in the first year, but that's not really a sign of poor reliability. The 2018 Tundra, for example, also had four recalls in its first year. I'm sure at some point the turbos will need replacing. They're definitely not like the early turbos that barely lasted 70,000 miles, but it's still something that we will eventually wear out. Thankfully, they're not gonna break the bank or write off the vehicle when they go, but like Toyota's legendary 4.7 liter engine that needed a timing belt changed every 90,000 miles, you'll need to take the cost of the turbo replacement into consideration in the future if you end up going with one of these trucks. Build quality does seem to be lacking with the trim in a few spots on this truck. The rubber trim around my back windows has been out of place basically since I bought the truck. And recently I was doing 75 miles an hour, which is five below the speed limit, when a gust of wind blew the camera out of my passenger side mirror. Unfortunately, my third party extended warranty won't cover it because they see that as an external force and then my insurance doesn't want to cover it because they see that as a fault with the truck. I've also seen a lot of reports of the plastic cover down the side of the driver's seat cracking. I'd assume that's happening with people putting pressure on the seat sides when they're getting in and out of the vehicle, but obviously it's still an issue. From what I understand, Toyota have slightly revised the design, which should hopefully solve that problem. Everything else seems to be well made and well fitted without any rattles or creaks, and the finish of the interior is really nice. The interior of this truck is definitely a huge upgrade from the previous generation, which was really, really dated and felt cheap in a lot of places. But I will say, there is a lot of wind noise in the new Tundra. It's not like Jeep or Bronco levels of wind noise, but definitely a lot more than you expect from a truck that costs that much. There are two other things to mention, but there is a good possibility that they're my fault, not the truck's fault. Uh, the first is that my blind spot sensors quit working. This could have happened after I broke the rear bumper uh, or after I dragged it through a bunch of mud. And it's not the fault of the aftermarket bumper since it was already broken before I installed that. The other issue is that I am constantly breaking the factory sway bar links. 
that could be down to the suspension modifications that I made. So until someone with the factory setup breaks theirs off-road, I'm not gonna blame Toyota. There are also some weird quirks that I have mentioned before. One is that it resets the driving mode every time you shut off the engine. So if you're towing, you have to put it back into tow haul mode. Uh, or if you wanna drive in sport mode, you have to switch it to sport every time that you start up. Another one that is really annoying is that anytime a warning comes up, it will cycle constantly. If snow builds up on the radar sensor, it'll let you know, you can dismiss it, and then six seconds later, it's back again. You. The worst is when you're in four low because it turns off the traction control. So your truck lets you know that the traction control is off, you dismiss it, and again it comes back every six seconds. There are a couple of slightly more odd ones that won't affect you as much. One is to do with the shape of the hood, which collects water when it's raining, and then when you brake, all of that water goes pouring off the front of the hood catches the wind and ends up coming right back into the windshield. And another is that when you use the windshield wipers when you're going over about 75 miles an hour, or if you've got a headwind that ends up over 75 miles an hour, they don't really spray up onto the windshield. Now that I've complained about a bunch of stuff, it's probably worth adding that there are a lot of good things about the truck and things that just aren't worth spending time on in the video. Things like the headlights, they work. They're great, they're clear, they're bright, but I probably wouldn't bring them up unless there was a problem. If I sound like I hate the truck that I just spent $60,000 on last year, I don't. And I promise that I could find as many, if not more issues in an honest review of any other truck on the market. And if you think that your truck is perfect, then you're wrong. I could find problems with that too. I've been asked, all things considered, would I buy it again or would I replace it with anything? And right now, there's nothing else that I would buy or replace it with. If you're in the market for a half ton full-size truck that you want to modify for off-road, I think it is the best option. Capability, comfort, and aftermarket support are all there. If you want something to take off-road but plan to keep it mostly stock, I would actually recommend the Ford F-150 Tremor because it might be the better option. It slightly outperforms the Tundra off-road and can be ordered to suit your needs. The downside is that it doesn't have the aftermarket support that you get with the Tundra. The only thing I would maybe consider switching to is maybe the F250 Tremor or one of the Ram 2500 diesel models, but only if I needed something to tow with which I don't. There are a few things I would have changed about the truck if I was on the design team. I'm not saying that I'm better than them, but I maybe would have thrown a few ideas out there. Uh, one of them would have been some form of bed step built into either the rear bumper or the side of the truck. It is definitely not a deal breaker since you can get bumpers with bed steps built in. You can even order a bed step from Toyota, but it would have been nice to have that built into the truck. Another thing would have been the stock suspension. The travel on it is horrendous. Again, not a deal breaker because most of us who take these trucks off-road end up replacing the suspension immediately anyway. I would have also put real decent sized skid plates on the TRD off-road models. And finally, I would have offered all of those TRD off-road models with 18 inch wheels, not the 20 inch wheels that you find on the Limited and the 1794. Again, it's not a deal breaker because I was replacing those anyway. Something that I can't change is the lack of four auto or full-time four-wheel drive. I don't drive in the snow often, but when I do, I'm constantly switching from two-wheel drive to four-wheel drive and back again as the conditions change. If you've decided on the Tundra, there are multiple trims and options to pick from. Unfortunately, you can't custom order from Toyota in the US, so you have to see what the dealers have in stock or coming in on allocation and pick from those. My suggestion is to decide what your wants and your needs are, make a list of priorities, and then call around the dealers looking for what suits you. If a dealer says that they can order for you, then move on, unless you're in Canada. Apparently they can. There's no one answer to which trim level is best. If you want to have the TRD off-road package for off-road use and plan to add a lift and tires, then you can pick between the SR5, the Limited, or the 1794. The SR5 is the base model that comes with that package, and if you're happy with the minimal options, it's a great choice. In my opinion, the Limited is the best value one you can get. You get the larger fuel tank, big screen, cameras, the hydraulic cab mounts, 
and cooled Softex seats as standard, none of which are standard on the SR5. You can get most of them as options on the SR5, but it actually ends up adding up to close to and sometimes even more expensive than the Limited and you still don't get the hydraulic cab mounts or the cooled seats. If you wanna take it off-road, but don't want to modify it at all, then get the TRD Pro. The Pro is only worth getting if you don't plan on lifting or switching the tires. The TRD Pro is basically a limited with a one inch lift and slightly more aggressive tires, but it's often more expensive than adding a lift and tires to the limited. The other option instead of getting the TRD Pro is actually to get the F-150 tremor because I think it's probably a little more capable. If you're not taking it off-road then you can pick from any of the trims including the Platinum and the Capstone or even just the SR depending on the features that you want. If towing is your priority then the Limited and above have the optional hybrid engine and the trailer brake controllers come standard on the SR5 and above. Only the SR doesn't have the brake controller as standard and it has a detuned engine. The last piece of advice is to never pay markup. There are plenty of dealers charging MSRP. Uh, even when I bought mine early on, when supply was limited and demand was high, I was able to get it at MSRP. Finally, for those of you who are still here, go check out the comments and see how many people thought I was being serious when I said that tire size is what defines your masculinity and go make fun of them. Thanks for watching.